Hi, I'm Andy Rich. I work for Remote Rescue Training at the University of Utah. Um, remote Rescue Training has partnered with the Wilderness Medical Society to provide a bunch of the technical sessions in the Diploma in Mountain Medicine program. I've been involved in the WMS's uh, DIM program since its inception. Um, and we'll be working here today on improvised rescue and lightweight rope work and rescue systems. I have Matt Haberman and Steve uh, Akalis out with me here today. They work with remote rescue as well. In this video, we'll start with looking at the context and capability of lightweight systems, lightweight rope work and rescue systems. We'll look at some of the equipment that we might use for those systems. We'll talk about knots, hitches, and harnesses. We'll get into short roping and anchors, uh, fixed lines, rappelling, lowering, belaying, and even some lightweight raising systems. So let's go ahead and start off with talking about the context for lightweight, uh, rope, lightweight rescue and rope work systems. Uh, <clears throat> these kinds of systems are the kinds of systems uh, that we might use when the terrain changes and perhaps it becomes more difficult or consequential than we had expected. Maybe it's a little bit steeper than the description was or than showed on the map. Um, but if we have the skills and ability to move through, then maybe we can. Perhaps the conditions change uh, and they become more challenging because it becomes night or cold or rainy or snowy. Uh, maybe there's a decrease in ability um, because of injury or fatigue or fear. Or maybe there's just an ability gap uh, and lightweight systems can allow someone more skilled uh, to help somebody out who's a little bit less skilled. These are the kind of systems that I'll oftentimes use when I'm ski touring, uh, canyoneering, on summit scrambles, or even on a hasty team for a rescue team. It's not necessarily a substitution for uh, heavier weight uh, rope systems, um, but these, can, these kinds of systems very much have their place when we might not otherwise bring equipment or when we're traveling a long ways, but we think that we may need a short bit of equipment, but it's really impractical to carry heavy gear for uh, all the terrain that we're bound to cover. Uh, so we're trying to figure out ways that we can use lightweight systems uh, for short bits of terrain um, that'll allow us to improve our functionality. So let's talk about that functionality. What are the capabilities of these kinds of systems? Well, we can do a lot of the same stuff I just talked about, right? We can short rope, we can build hand lines, we can lower, we can repel, we can belay, we can raise. We basically are just gonna put one person on the rope system at a time though. Uh, unlike some heavier weight systems where we can add additional people onto the system, these are systems designed just for one person. The technical details of these systems should be pretty fundamental. Uh, if it doesn't feel simple, then the, it's probably not right to use these kinds of systems. Because inherent in these systems is that there's not a whole lot of backups built in. There aren't many fa fail safes built into these kinds of systems. And so we need to be really cautious and prudent as we, uh, as we try to utilize these systems. Application is really the hard part with these. The technical details shouldn't be that difficult, but the application can be very challenging. Choosing the right tool for the job, deciding whether I'm gonna repel or lower can really make a difference. And then making those minor adjustments to make the tool behave smoothly as opposed to feeling dangerous. We need to think about anticipating problems while we're working with lightweight rope work systems. Um, some of the common problems that we see are poor anticipation of fall line or line of travel. That's very common pinches and sharp rocks. Of course, we're working with thin ropes, so we have to be very careful of sharp rocks. Loose rock, always a problem, but generally with these kinds of systems, we find ourselves moving around in the kind of terrain where it's not common that many other people have worked with ropes there in that area. So instead of those rocks being cleared by previous parties, there might be a bunch of loose rock. So we really have to be careful of loose rock as we're working with these systems. Um, <clears throat> not recognizing terrain, uh, changes in terrain is super important. As people look at terrain before you actually get on it or try to anticipate how the rope system will interact with that terrain, uh, not recognizing slight changes in terrain or how abrupt a, a, a change in the terrain is um, 
<clears throat> that's common and can be problematic. So really be careful with that. Of course, again, because we'll be working with skinny ropes, uh, not anticipating the behavior of skinny ropes and how they, what kind of friction they create, and how difficult it is to hold on to them is another common problem. And of course, as with all rope work systems, especially when we start to uh, be deviating from what we expected to be doing for the day, communications. Always communications can be a challenge. We have the fortunate situation with lightweight rope work systems that we're usually working in fairly short bits of terrain, short pitches. Um, so that can facilitate communication, but uh, we need to make sure that communication doesn't become a problem. There are a bunch of other problems that can come up with lightweight ro rope work systems, and we need to be cautious. Uh, we need, because of that, we need to be cautious with all these systems. Um, <clears throat> if things don't seem to be going smoothly, we shouldn't hesitate to look for non-technical options. Passing packs, micro-navigation that makes the terrain much simpler. Um, some kind of way of uh, reducing the hazard that we're exposing ourselves to. Just because we have the tools and techniques to utilize lightweight rope work systems doesn't mean that we should. So use these skills to allow ourselves to expand our capability, but use them with caution. Let's take a look at the equipment that we use in these lightweight rope work and rescue systems. So I've got a small pack here, a pack that I would use for a uh, summit scramble or short day hike. Uh, as a part of that pack, I've got a little kit here. And this is my lightweight rope work kit. Plenty of room for other stuff in here as well. Um, <clears throat> take a look at what's in here and then we'll look at some other options of what might be in here other times. Uh, <clears throat> so I do have in here a rope, of course. And then in addition to my rope, I have a piece of webbing, a sling, few beaners um, and then I have additionally uh, a prusik, a harness and a few pieces of uh, rock protection. And that's it. That's my kit. Um, let's start with each one of these. We'll go through each one uh, and talk about each one and what you might add in different cases. So starting off with the rope, um, let's talk first about rope diameter. Um, I've chosen in my kit here and my kind of default for when I use these lightweight rope work kits is an eight millimeter diameter rope. Um, sometimes I'll use a six, sometimes I'll use a 10, uh, but that's kind of the range I'm looking at. Um, I really like a six millimeter rope, um, which is super lightweight. Um, I like a six millimeter rope if I'm pretty sure that the thing I'm gonna be doing with my lightweight kit is, um, is maybe a short rappel and that's it. Um, <clears throat> of course, if I think I'm gonna be doing a rappel, then I have to have my rope doubled over, so probably a little bit more length. Um, but a skinny rope uh, allows me to carry more length and still keep it really light. Um, I'm not worried about strength um, with this when it's doubled up in a rappel, um, but function is really a concern, right? The, the amount of friction that I get in my winter uh, or whatever device I'm using, uh, the ability to hold on to that rope and really thinking about cutting hazard. So function and cutting hazard are, are an issue for me with six mil rope. Uh, they make um, you know, lowering much more challenging, short roping super difficult. Um, maybe I could short rope a small child with six mil cord, uh, but probably not an adult. Um, uh, so six mil is okay for some things, and sometimes that's what, what'll be in my kit. Um, sometimes uh, 10 mil, if I'm pretty sure that short roping is what I'm gonna be doing, then having a fatter piece of cord that I can really get a good purchase on and hold onto with my hand can really make a difference. Uh, so if I'm pretty sure repelling is my thing, then I might go with six mil. If I'm pretty sure short roping is my thing, I might go with 10 mil. I'm not quite sure what I'm getting into. I might rappel, I might lower, I might short rope, I might end up doing a little belay. Eight mil is really a nice balance that allows me to kind of use all the things there uh, where I don't have to worry about strength, function, or cutting hazard all so much. Great. As far as length goes, um, again, depending on what I think I'm gonna be doing, if I think I'm gonna be rappelling a little bit longer piece of cord, this is 100 feet. Um, seems like that will help me out. Doubled over. Um, 
that theoretically should give me a 50 foot rappel, but I can never really put anchors exactly where I want. And I would need to have a little bit extra at the bottom. So, you know, it, that all gets gobbled up pretty quickly. Um, if I'm pretty sure short roping is my thing, then a shorter piece like this is, I think, 45 feet um, could be a nice size, uh, fatter, shorter cord uh, for short roping could be a really nice size. Uh, again, trying to strike my balance of weight and function. Um, I have chosen to go with an 8 mil 100 foot piece of cord. Um, this is kind of my default position for these kits. Um, it will vary depending on what I'm doing, but that is nice. Uh, there. Basically, I think the 60 to 100 foot is about the right range for length of rope um, and maybe shorter if you're pretty sure short roping or just a short hand line is what's in the cards. Great. Carabiners. So I have in my kit here, I have, let me make sure that thing doesn't slide away. I have just four carabiners. That's it. Um, three of them are lockers. Um, in fact, mine are auto lockers, which I like. It makes it less likely that they open accidentally. Um, the non-lockers are just as strong as the lockers. The only real difference is that the lockers are a little bit heavier and the non-lockers can be opened uh, at any time. Um, that can be on purpose or by accident. Um, I figure if I'm only going to have a few beaners, carabiners, then I'm likely to have them in critical places and I'm likely to want to make sure that they stay locked. Uh, so mostly lockers seems like a good fit. Um, again, trying to strike that balance. I think about four carabiners will get me what I need. Um, and if most of them are lockers, that seems about right. So that's what I've chosen. Um, I might add to this. I probably won't subtract a whole lot. Might, might go down to two, but I'm starting to get to uh, unusable pretty quickly. Uh, uh, might bump up to, you know, four or five or five or six uh, carabiners if, um, in some cases. Great. Let's see. So I also have uh, a sling. Oop, whoa, slidey rock. I have a uh, sewn sling here. It's a piece of Dyneema sewn sling. Um, this is uh, a what's referred to as a quad, which means I can quadruple it over four times and then it fits nicely over my shoulder. Uh, it's also a 240 centimeter length. Uh, that's another way to describe the length, 240 centimeters, a little bit more accurately. Um, this skinny Dyneema material is super strong, super lightweight. Um, and great for building anchors. Um, and that's my basic purpose in having this stuff um, is for anchor building. Uh, and so we'll look at some options for how we do that later. Um, but a good, strong, lightweight, versatile option for that. Great. Um, let's see. I have in here, oh, I have a little knife that comes along with me. Um, and my tiny little knife is basically for the purpose of if, um, if my rope gets rope or webbing or something gets wedged in a little crack stuck someplace, uh, then I can cut out a part of it um, and not have to leave the whole rope behind. And that can be pretty useful. Super lightweight uh, and allows me uh, not to likely have to leave any stuff behind. Um, I have a piece of red webbing. Um, this is a 20 one foot piece of uh, one inch tubular webbing. Uh, this works nicely to tie a harness onto somebody. I can tie it on myself or anybody else. Um, it'll fit the largest person and the smallest person. So it's got that versatility built into it. Um, also, if we don't need a harness on somebody, then I can use this for uh, additional material to build an anchor or it's 20 some 20 feet long. So it's good also for hauling a pack up a short step. Um, and so that can be pretty darn useful um, as well. Um, and then this last, these last couple items here, oh, no, sorry. And then there's, and then there's a Prusik and I have a Prusik cord as well. Um, one short Prusik loop. Um, Again, going back to my rope diameter, um, my Prusik loop is six millimeter cord, which won't bite very well on six millimeter cord, but does bite pretty well on eight millimeter cord or 10 millimeter cord. So 
again, I lose some of my versatility if I carry that six mil. Obviously it's lighter, um, but I lose some of my versatility there, which is why I tend away from a function perspective from the six mil and more towards the eight mil so that I can have a Prusik that will bite. Um, uh, the Prusik can be really useful for putting on the brake side of a, of a friction hitch, such as a Munter for repelling or lowering. Um, I can put it as a haul Prusik. Uh, I can use it on a fixed line. Um, so having the ability to use a Prusik for something can work pretty nicely. Um, sometimes I'll put a second one in. Um, and then the last couple items here I have, um, I don't, aren't always in my kit. They're kind of optional. Um, uh, let's see, I have a harness. Uh, these lightweight, uh, lightweight harnesses um, are super light. I mean, it really in comparison to this piece of webbing, they're similar weight. This thing might be a little bit lighter. Bulk wise, they're pretty similar. Um, comfort wise, this is certainly more comfortable, but we're not gonna be in a harness all that long, so that doesn't really matter. Um, one of the things that does matter is that this will move back, move from one person to another more rapidly if we have to get multiple people into a harness. Um, this is pretty slow to do, this is pretty fast to do, um, but this won't fit everybody and this will. Um, depending on the case, I'm, I usually will bring this and I sometimes will bring this. Um, and then my last couple pieces I have, uh, if rock protection is already in your toolkit and you know how to use it and you own it um, and you use it regularly, um, having a few pieces of rock protection can really expand your options as far as what you're capable, uh, where you're capable of building anchors. Um, we don't, with lightweight systems, we don't tend to bring the large pieces, just the small cams. Um, in this case, kind of as a default position, I've brought two cams. I'm carrying two cams two little cams and three stoppers. That's my rack. Um, uh, it also was fairly normal for me to leave these behind and have that not be a part of the kit. Um, so put that in my optional. Um, and then another thing in the optional is the helmet. Uh, you know, if we're gonna spend a lot of time on ropes, helmets are a must. Um, but if we're carrying a kit that we may or may not use, Helmets are bulky. They take up space, they're a little bit heavy, uh, and they don't always make the cut. Um, you'll see in our video demos today, we're gonna be wearing helmets um, because we know that we're actually gonna be on the rope. Um, but the truth of it is that with a lightweight kit, the helmet doesn't always make the cut, which makes our uh, concern for rockfall hazard even more serious. Um, so we have to be much more careful with rockfall hazard if we're not likely to be wearing a helmet. Um, Again, depending on the case, I might bring it, um, but it's, uh, it's certainly, um, I'd say, probably less likely. So what that actually means my kit looks like is a piece of webbing, a sling, a Prusik, my lockers, my knife, um, and my rope, and that's it. All the rest of this stuff, uh, optional, or things I might uh, do on various different days. How much will you carry will depend hugely on your objectives and your location and the geology and your group size and all that. Um, generally, I'm thinking of this as the only kit, the only rope kit for your group. Um, so I'm considering that nobody else in the group has a rope kit. This is the kit for the group. Um, uh, but the goal in trying to determine what you're going to bring is to make a functional and versatile kit with minimal weight and bulk. So that if at the end of the day it turns out you ended up not using your kit, it's fine that you carried it. It wasn't that big, it wasn't that heavy, um, and it provide you, provided you with a bit of insurance um, so that if things did go a little bit sideways, then you had some more options. And if at some point during the day, um, you also want the kit to be one that will be functional and will allow you to help um, expand your capabilities um, and make things better rather than just getting you in deeper uh, and making things more dangerous. Um, so hopefully having a look at this and giving uh, you some sense of the 
kind of equipment, the amount and type of equipment that we're talking about for these lightweight rope work and rescue kits uh, will help frame um, the skills as we move forward. Let's take a look at the knots, hitches, and tied harnesses that we use in lightweight rope work and rescue systems. This is going to be a pretty short list of knots, um, <clears throat> and they should be pretty versatile knots. And hopefully what we're trying to do with that is achieve some simplicity. I don't want to have an exhaustive list and one knot that's perfect for this one thing, complicated knots. I want to keep it nice and short, versatile, uh, with some versatile knots. So we'll talk about overhands, figure eights, prussics, munters, and square knots. I know, square knot doesn't seem like a climbing knot, but bear with me. Let's start with the overhand knots. <clears throat> Generally, we tie overhand knots in webbing material. Um, we, can tie it in cord, we can tie overhands in cord material as well, um, but generally we think of uh, webbing material as the place where we tie um, overhands. So um, <clears throat> I'll start off with just one end uh, and the super simple version of the, the first version of the overhand is the skeleton. Uh, I just make a loop, I stick the end through, and I create a simple overhand knot skeleton. Pretty straightforward. Um, if I make a bite out of this piece of webbing, which is to say a 180 degree bend, I make a bite out of this piece of webbing, treat these two strands as though they were one, and make that same loop, stick the end through, stick the bite through that loop, and tie that down, snug that down, then I have an overhand on a bite. Uh, so that gives me some place I can clip into. I have two parts coming out of the knot there um, <clears throat> and something I can clip into. Great, uh, super useful. Um, and then I have one other really useful um, knot with uh, the over in the overhand series is the bend. So if I make my skeleton on one end, oops, there we go. Make my skeleton on one end, okay. Then I'll grab the other end, come on up here, other end. And the definition of a bend uh, is that bends connect ends. Bends connect ends. So if I take this end, go to the other end, and then just simply follow it through on this knot, I will <clears throat> pull enough through there that I can make it through, wrap it around following, Wrap it around following and all the way through. So when I tie my overhand bend, I should end up with the ends coming out opposite sides of the overhand. Uh, this is sometimes called a, a ring bend or a water knot. Um, whatever, take your pick. There's lots of different names. It's an overhand bend. It's a ring bend. Um, it's a water knot. <laughs> Uh, and so this ties my piece of webbing in a big loop, um, or if I have two pieces of webbing I want to connect together, um, then it makes, then it connects the two pieces together nicely. Um, a couple things to note um, on all knots, um, we should be thinking about dressing. Um, and so you can see in this particular knot I have all my strands knit laying nice and flat together. This is particularly noticeable when I'm tying knots with webbing. Um, the dressing is quite noticeable. We'll look at it uh, when we start tying in cord here in just a second. Um, and, uh, and that seems uh, like it makes my knot neater, uh, easier to identify, and a little bit stronger. Um, I also need to have appropriate length tails. Um, uh, basically, depending on the type of material uh, and the knot, um, you know, the, tail, the required tail length will vary. Um, but I think a good starting point is if I can grab the tail, there should be a little bit that sticks out the other side of my hand there. Is, this is a bit more than I need. That's fine. I don't want less. Um, so I should be able to see some sticking out the other side. Um, depending on the material, people have other ways of trying to figure out what's the appropriate amount of tail. I think that is a pretty good simple, uh, simple tool that will work for almost all materials and all knots. Great. Dressing and tails. Good. So those are our overhands, the skeleton, the bite, and the bend. Let's look uh, at a piece of cord material here. Uh, we'll look at a piece of cord and we'll tie some figure eights. Okay, so 
I've got my short piece of Prusik uh, cord here. Um, and I'm gonna do figure eights. So same way I made that loop last time, but instead of coming up through like that, I'm gonna continue around. So I'll make that loop and then continue around one more and then I'll just come through that loop the opposite direction. So if I come through the loop the opposite direction, then you can see I have something that looks kind of like an eight there. That's my figure eight skeleton. If I make a 180 degree bend in my piece of cord, treat both strands as though they were one, and again, wrap around, <clears throat> then I should come up with a figure eight on a bite. Uh, again, creating a clip-in point uh, in a piece of cord, which is very useful. Um, <clears throat> and then following on the theme here, you'll notice if I make a figure eight skeleton near one end, take the other end and bends connect ends, I can make a figure eight bend, bends connect ends, start to follow through here. All right, pull enough through that I can get it all the way in. <clears throat> Let's see, following, following, following. And you can see I end up with a uh, figure eight bend, which is to say that the, I made this piece of cord into a loop. Um, the uh, ends that go into the loops are on opposite sides of the knot. The uh, tails are on opposite sides of the, of the bend there. Um, the tails are long enough, right, long enough. Um, and you can see that knot is nice and dressed. I've got nice parallel strands uh, throughout that figure eight there. Um, and that's exactly what I'm looking for. Um, with the knots and cord, especially smaller cord and figure eights, um, I could certainly twist some of these things around a little bit. And now it's not perfectly dressed. I have a couple of small uh, crosses in there, um, but I'm not gonna get too worked up about this. I wanna make sure that I can identify the knot, that it's tied correctly. If it's not 100% dressed, it's still plenty strong. It's still plenty easy to untie. As long as it's easily and unquestionably identifiable, it's plenty dressed. Um, this shouldn't be that hard to fix either, just by rolling a couple of these around. If you're really familiar with these, I can fix that problem, um, but we don't need to spend huge amounts of time worrying about getting it 100% dressed if it's already dressed enough. Great. Um, then there is one last figure eight, um, which is pretty useful, which is our figure eight follow through. Um, <clears throat> And the figure eight follow through is a means to tie into the end of the rope. Generally, that's what it's used for. Um, once I get a harness on, I'll, I'll show that one. Um, but it's the same basic idea as a bend, just going into the opposite side. Great. Um, so we're, so I'm, I'm next going to move into some hitches. I'll move into the Prusik hitch and the Munter hitch. Uh, hitches, the difference between hitches and knots, are that hitches take the form of the thing that they're tied around. Um, and so uh, they conform to that item. Um, <clears throat> let's look. Uh, hmm. Let me put my <clears throat> figure eight. I should maybe, here we go, put my figure eight. Uh, figure eight bend, also known as a Flemish bend, back into my Prusik. And then, uh, so I'll tie the Prusik hitch. And the Prusik hitch, um, I tie around another piece of cord. Uh, the diameter difference between the host material and the Prusik cord uh, is what makes or breaks the biting. Um, the more of a difference there is, the more the Prusik will bite. Uh, six mil cord on eight mil cord will bite plenty well. Uh, six mil on six, not so much. Six on 10 bites great, but six on eight is uh, certainly adequate. Um, so I'll start this uh, by putting 
a part, a, a byte of my, <coughs> excuse me, of my Prusik, uh loop um, around that 8 mil cord, and then I'll stick the end through. This um, is simply known as a girth hitch or a lark split, um, but that's no matter. We've all done this, no question. Um, if I hold on to this little bridge here, I hold on to this little bridge, and then I keep wrapping in that same direction, keep wrapping in that same direction, and come back under that bridge again, then I have two wraps there, right? Two wraps, which is to say four strands. I hold on to that bridge again and wrap right underneath it one more time. If I've been diligent about keeping those strands that go uh, out from the knot in the center, then these two strands should come in in the center, then they wrap out towards the sides, a bridge that goes from end to end, a six pack of donuts, and that's my three wrap Prusik. That's my default position for uh, creating a Prusik, and the objective of the Prusik is that it will slide easily on the host material until you set it, and as you grab onto it, set it and grab onto it, then it will bite quite well. So this is a rope grab um, <clears throat> that also will release and slide. Release and slide, grab. Excellent. Um, Prusik super useful uh, and uh, yeah super useful there it is great the next one we're going to look at is called the uh, the munter hitch or also oftentimes referred to as the italian hitch um, the italian hitch um, again there are many ways to this one in particular there are many ways to tie this if you know a different way to tie it it's fine as long as it ends up at the same result it's all good uh, the way I like to make it, I like to make a loop, and then with either one of those sides, I can make a U. So you can see with this side, I've just made a U here. Yep. And when I make that U, then I clip the two. Make a loop, make a U, clip the two. When I made this loop, if I prefer to make the U on the other side, I still have a U there, and I can clip that. I end up with basically the same thing. What the Munter or Italian hitch does for us is um, it creates friction. It's a, it's a, rather than a rope grab, it is a friction hitch, uh, which um, we can use for belaying, we can use for repelling, um, and it'll flip over and go either direction. So rope should slide through this. Um, so I should be able to go that way or go that way and rope should slide through this. Um, of course, this will be clipped into a harness or anchor or wherever, um, but we do need to tie this around something uh, and a carabiner is the spot where we usually tie it. Great. One last knot that we'll do before I wanna look at um, a tied harness. Um, is the square knot. Um, and the square knot is not one that people off usually think of as a climbing knot. Um, that's whatever, that is what it is. Um, but for the purposes, and that's true, it's not really a climbing knot. Uh, but for the purposes of tying a harness, uh, a tied harness onto somebody, a uh, square knot is super useful. Um, so I have my two ends this is all tied around something. I have my two ends. I have on my side, I have the left side going over the right. And then I go under, right? So I've just made like the beginning of a, uh, a bow that you'd tie your shoes with. So if I go left over right, and then on the next one, I go right over left and then pull through. Then when I snug it down, then I should see that I have the two strands on either side coming out parallel to one another um, and without anything in between them. Yeah, so that is the square knot. Um, this is not a climbing knot, uh, but it is a good binding knot that helps uh, tighten something down. Uh, in order to make it secure enough to be a square knot, um, what we'll usually do is then take one end, 
wrap it around, cross itself, and when I cross itself, then I come back through, and basically I've tied a, an overhand skeleton around that other strand. If I tie an overhand skeleton around that other strand there, then I've secured this end. I still have adequate tail. Yep, still have adequate tail. And it's snugged right in there, so I got the binding of the square knot and the security of the overhand there to snug this in. I'll put this into context um, for a tied harness uh, in just a second. Okay, so I want to show you how to tie, uh, tie a harness with a piece of webbing onto somebody. I'll show you tying it onto myself. Certainly you can tie this on somebody else as well. Uh, same basic setup. I prefer to call this a tied harness. Some people like calling it a hasty harness or a Swiss seat. Um, there are a number of different kinds of d different techniques that you can use to tie harnesses on. I'll show you the one that I think uh, works the best. I've got my piece of, uh, piece of webbing here. Um, I just need to grab it somewhere near the middle. It doesn't need to be right in the middle, but I grab it somewhere near the middle um, and start with that, kind of holding it right around my belly button. Hold it around my belly button. I'll reach behind my leg, grab one side of it, pull it around back behind my leg, and then feed it through uh, that bite that I'm holding right in front of my groin there. Okay, excellent. That's just let that sit on one side. Uh, I have this other strand dangling on my right side there. I'll reach around and do the exact same thing on that side. So now I have two strands that are going back behind the top of my thigh, but up my upper legs there. Um, and, uh, and now I'm going to take these both and come around behind me. And as I come around behind me, I'll start to wrap these around. Um, and I'm getting towards the end. I'm looking towards the end of where these are. Uh, because I was a little bit offset, I'm not going to... Um, I'll get more wraps on one side than I do on the other. That's fine. Um, so I wrap these around, um, and it looks to me, I want to end up tying this. Uh, I prefer not to tie it right in the center front here, because this is where I'm going to either clip in or tie into the rope. Um, so it looks to me like I'm going to end up with this knot just offset on this side, and I'll have enough tail to tie this securely. Um, so I'll start left over right. Snug, the binding action of the square knot is pretty useful here. Then I'll go right over left. Snug, and you can see I've got that square knot with those two strands coming out parallel, unimpeded on either side. Um, and then I'll do, wrap that around, cross itself, feed the end through, keep that, uh, keep that overhand skeleton nice and close to the square knot. I have plenty of tail there. A little bit extra is fine. Not enough is not okay. Um, <clears throat> so I've got those tails coming out away from the overhand, or, or excuse me, from the uh, from the square knot, and I've tied my harness. And this is plenty secure and strong. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do also is tie in with a uh, figure eight follow through. So let me show you that. Um, the way we usually attach to the end of the rope uh, is by making a skeleton knot in the uh, figure eight skeleton in the cord that we're going to tie into. Um, and with this harness, I can either clip into these, all this stuff that's right in the front of me here. So whatever is around my waist, as well as the one strand that's uh, closest to my groin there, uh, take the end of the knot rope I'm tying into put it behind both of those two, uh, pull up, and then uh, if I were tying a bend, I'd come in this way, but I'm tying a follow through, so I'm gonna come in this way. And so when I tie the follow through, it's the same action, following through, following through, following through. Uh, but in this case, I end up with, basically I've tied a figure eight on a bite around something. Um, and I do that by tying a figure eight follow through. Um, I have enough tail here, a little bit more than I like to have, but, uh, but that's okay. 
Um, I don't need a what people call a safety knot. Uh, the figure eight is plenty strong and secure as is. If I have more tail than I want and I want to get that tail out of the way, then that's fine. I can tie it up, uh, but there's no need for that. Um, this is a fine amount of tail. Uh, this is kind of as much as I would possibly want. Uh, really, I'd rather have it be uh, whatever, four inches shorter, uh, which would mean it would just barely come out of my hand there, and that'd be great. Um, so that's my tied harness and my figure eight follow through. So that's it for knots. Um, we've talked about the overhand, the figure eight, the Prusik, uh, the Munter, and the square knot. Um, hopefully that short list of simple knots is versatile um, and um, allows you to do everything that you need to do in lightweight rope work systems. Um, there are a lot of um, online resources that help people uh, to practice and familiarize themselves with knots. Uh, one of the ones I think is great is the Animated Knots by Grog. Um, but beware with all these online resources um, that many of them will have different names uh, and emphasize different uses and purposes for knots. So uh, expect that. Um, most people need more practice with knots than uh, most people need practice with knots. Um, and so it's worth uh, pulling out some cord and making sure that that feels pretty uh, fundamental. Um, we can't really get into using the rest of the systems. Uh, we can't hope to use the rest of the systems until we have those things totally dialed. Um, because the technical bits on lightweight systems really should feel uh, pretty basic so that we can focus on the, on the application. Short roping is a technique that allows two people to move together through exposed terrain. Uh, the two people can move together simultaneously, while one person more experienced, uh, and confident and secure in the terrain, provides balance and security to a person who is less secure. Um, because of that, this is a technique that is mostly used for guides. Uh, guides use this to move clients through exposed terrain all day long. Um, for our purposes, moving sick patients, uh, injured patients through exposed terrain who are unstable or unreliable uh, can be a really useful tool. Uh, this technique does require a lot of experience and it's best to think of something that's done by guides, um, but certainly it's a technique that can be really, really useful. It requires a lot, a lot of practice. It's important to know that uh, short roping is not dragging people. The person who's moving along behind has to be on their own feet. They're getting security and balance from the guide in front of them, uh, but they have to be moving on their own feet. So when you're short roping, um, using a fatter rope is really pretty helpful. Eight to 11 millimeters is about the right size. Uh, any skinnier than that, and it's real difficult to hold on to. Uh, preferably on the fatter end is really useful. Connect right into the harness um, and I can connect into the harness on my on my client there as well. Um, if I, he's gonna be in and out of that rope then having him uh, clip in is just fine. If he's gonna be in for a long term uh, then I'll probably have him tie in. I'm gonna hold coils in one hand and use the other hand to control tension between myself and my client or patient. Um, so this, this hand really fights the slack between the two of us um, and allows me to help him control balance uh, and provide him security. This hand just controls uh, the rest of the rope. If the rope that I have is a little bit too long and these are too many coils for me to carry, um, then I can also make some shoulder coils. And I can go ahead and do this by putting some coils right around my neck, like that, put my shoulder, put my arm through, and come around tie this off and make this secure around here. Ultimately, I'm still gonna be, uh, my security isn't coming from my harness here. My security for my patient is coming through my hand here and I'm still carrying coils. The objective here is simply to prevent a slip from turning into a fall. Uh, I can't hold the full dynamic load, but if I can minimize slip uh, or minimize the amount that he slips, the distance that he slips when he slips, then I can stop him, stop that from turning into a fall. I need to have a really firm grip on this rope. Uh, the best grip I can get on this rope is by putting my pinky towards my patient or client. Um, I have a much less secure grip in this orientation, much more secure grip in this orientation. Uh, certainly, um, <clears throat> I want to fight that slack there. If, there's, if I introduce slack into this system like this, 
uh, then he's much more likely to take a fall that I'm going to not be able to hold. Um, while at the same time, I don't want to yank him off balance and off his stance. I want to allow him to move along unencumbered and provide him security, balance, and prevent slips from becoming a fall. The closer we can stay to one another, the easier it is to manage a hand belay appropriately. If I get 20, 20 feet away from him, uh, it's really difficult to maintain the security with the use of a hand belay. A hand belay is useful when we're very close to each other, less than 10 feet for sure, um, close to one another. Ultimately, the security of this system comes through the stance of the guide. Uh, there's no uh, security that I get from the rope. Uh, it's just from my stance in this system. So I need to be really careful in timing my stance and making sure that when I anticipate that he might slip, I'm in a secure position. There are lots of benefits to short roping. One is that unlike other techniques, Short roping doesn't have to stay in the same fall line. Because the two people are moving together through the terrain, they can change fall lines and move throughout the terrain fluidly. Um, also, because they're close together, communications are facilitated really well. Um, easy communication, lots of coaching throughout. The psychological benefits for the client or patient can be huge. Instead of being scared and nervous about where to go, they get constant coaching and direction, provide a lot of confidence and allow people to move a lot more efficiently and securely. Also, short roping is conceptually very simple and requires minimal gear, just a rope. Really, we don't even need a harness. I could just tie an uh, overhand on a bite and have my uh, patient climb right through that. This rope could all be in my pack. A short piece of fat rope, we're good to go. Short roping is a great way to move exhausted, ataxic, cold patients who might be stumbly or otherwise unreliable, or just people who need a little bit more security uh, and confidence as they're moving through terrain. Guides use this technique all the time. They're able to do it because they're skilled. Oftentimes also, they're able to do it because they're familiar with terrain. Familiarity with terrain really helps out a lot. Short roping oftentimes runs seamlessly straight into short pitching, where we move together through terrain and then, and then we move one at a time. So the guide will scamper up through a short bit, give a quick, we have a quick belay as the patient moves up through, and then we'll start moving together as we short rope again. We'll look at short pitching uh, a little bit later as we uh, look at some other techniques. A few things to be careful of with short roping. One, the guide really gets no security at all from the rope system. And so it's easy to be lulled into a false sense of security. Yes, we have a rope, but that rope is not for the person on the front end of it. It's for the person on the downhill end. Uh, so make sure not to get a false sense of security out of it. And it is a high consequence activity. If we mess it up, we can have high consequences. Something to really be careful of is that r weight differences can make all the difference in the world. Uh, when I'm short roping my, my four-year-old, I feel like we can go through very steep terrain and I'm very confident. Uh, when I put someone like Matt on the rope, um, I feel like I need to tone it down quite a bit. Uh, so we need to be c careful about that and make sure that we have appropriate, uh, pr appropriate terrain choices for the person that we're working with uh, for our ability. Experienced guides can um, short rope two people at a time, but really we should think of this as a one at a time activity, right? One guide and one patient or client. Um, Lastly, this is a really poor feedback activity. You might feel like everything's going super well when you're short roping, but it could just be that your system hasn't been tested, that that person hasn't leaned back and slipped at that moment when you weren't paying attention. Make sure that we, everything is lined up appropriately. Short roping can be a great solution for moving somebody who's stumbly and ataxic through exposed terrain. Uh, I think of this as a, a classic is really cold patients or, or patients with uh, altitude sickness trying to descend down steep alpine terrain. Um, very, very effective. Um, but it does require experience, um, and so we should look to guides as the people to do this. Let's talk some about anchors. So while we don't use anchors when we're short roping, anchors are a foundation for all the rest of our rope systems. 
When we start to look at anchors, we'll talk about strength, and we'll talk about alignment and focal points for each one of the anchors we look at. The types of anchors we're talking about for these lightweight systems are trees, rocks, maybe a position anchor, as well as maybe quickly looking at Rock Pro. Let's talk first about strength. So while we usually think of these types of systems as body weight systems, there's likely to be some dynamic loading in every one of these systems. How much depends on application, but there will be some. Beyond that, anchor failure is likely to be highly consequential, even in small terrain. So really, we want to make sure that these systems are strong enough. Anchor failure is not an option. Alignment. Where an anchor uh, connects to the rope system, uh, or excuse me, where an anchor is positioned in the terrain, uh, determines what line of travel can be used in that terrain. The line of travel and the alignment of the anchor must line up. And lastly, the focal point. The focal point is where the rope connects to the anchor. We need to think about managing uh, rope length and functionality when we determine where we put our focal point. So we'll think about each of those as we get into our anchor systems. Let's look at tree anchors. So thinking about strength of tree anchors, I think it should be obvious that this tree is plenty strong. It's alive, its diameter is huge. <clears throat> I can access the base of it really well. Um, we're gonna use some smaller trees sometimes, uh, but let's start off with this one. Um, one of the configurations I can use that I really like is with my sling, a piece of sling material. Um, since this is a, a 240, it will allow me to go around even really pretty large trees. Um, and I can go around right like this. I can clip right into these two and create my focal point right here. That's ready to attach to a rope for rappelling or lowering or belaying. Um, if this tree wasn't quite as strong, I'd want to make sure uh, to be all the way down at the base so that I don't lever off it. Um, that seems like a pretty good consideration. Um, <clears throat> if I am trying to minimize material and make my, uh, make my system really simple, I can also use my piece of cord to attach uh, right into the rope. Say I tie a figure eight skeleton into my rope with enough tail to go around the tree. <clears throat> right around like this. <clears throat> And I do a figure eight follow through here. So I basically ended up with what looks like a figure eight on a bite around the tree. This is a great configuration for making a hand line or a single line repel if I don't need it to be retrievable. I need friction concerns to think about there, but I can easily fix a rope to a tree. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, when I start to use the rope as part of the anchor, uh, then I'm using, losing some of my rope length. And rope length uh, concerns are always an issue in these lightweight systems. Um, <clears throat> but if I uh, want to simplify this even further, uh, you know, I could take my rope and I could just wrap it right around the tree. Uh, and I could give a terrain, I could use the friction of this tree uh, for a terrain belay. Um, we want to minimize the amount that we have running ropes, uh, especially weighted ropes, around, around trees because we'll damage the trees. And so we want to make sure we minimize uh, putting weighted ropes around trees, lowering people off trees. Um, but we can get a lot of friction uh, and you know, something like this basically fixes that rope. Um, and that's, I could tie this off uh, again, just with a, say, a simple overhand skeleton, and that rope is fixed right there. So pretty simple, uh, some of the configurations that we can use to tie around trees. When we want to use rocks for anchors, um, there's a few things we need to think about. Strength, for sure. Is it strong enough? This looks like a horn. I think it's also a part of the earth. It's well embedded into the earth. 
It doesn't have to be necessarily. Certainly boulders sitting on top of the earth can be strong enough, but we should think about how they're positioned and what they're sitting on top of. I also need to think about the security of my attachment. Um, <clears throat> pretty easy to imagine. Throw in a sling around this hunk of rock here, and um, depending on my alignment, you can imagine it's uh, sliding back up off the top of the back of this. Um, so, um, so I need to make sure that I have security of my attachment. And that, uh, that security can come from the shape of the actual piece of rock itself. Um, it also is dramatically affected by the alignment that we pull on the anchor. So we need to think about the alignment and how that uh, coincides with the strength, with the shape of the anchor to make sure that we have adequate security. And then lastly, sharpness, making sure that we uh, don't have anything that's too sharp that's going to damage our materials. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for a chunk of rock like this, I might just throw a single strand of my sling back behind this thing and, uh, <clears throat> and pull on it right like that. Um, if my alignment lines up pretty nicely, then having this thing long and extended like that is more likely to uh, um, reduce the chances that it's going to flip off the top. If I'm more concerned about um, sharp edges uh, than I am about the uh, security of the attachment there, um, <clears throat> then I might double this thing up. I might double this up and clip a carabiner right in there. Um, I've gotten a little bit more protection from the sharp edges there because each one of those strands has less force on it. Uh, but this is likely, uh, this is more likely to slide up off the top. So that sort of depends on exactly how my alignment uh, lines into this thing. If I'm pulling down on this, um, then this is probably pretty good as is. If I start pulling even just slightly in this orientation, I'm going to be a lot more worried about the security of the attachment on this particular piece of rock. Lastly, uh, or a couple other things, um, I might mention this angle here between these two strands is about 90 degrees, and we really don't want that angle much wider than that. Um, so if it starts approaching 90 degrees and starts looking like it might be a little bit wider, um, then we might think about dropping a strand and going down and getting a much narrow, narrower angle there. Um, and the last thing I'll mention, and this is true with all these anchors, um, is that people who are used to climbing anchors or rescue anchors in more traditional senses will say, hey, that's not a redundant anchor. I'm used to working with redundant anchors. You know what, on these lightweight systems, we oftentimes don't have the luxury of being able to build redundant anchors. Um, we don't have enough equipment, uh, and we don't have the alignment oftentimes that will work for that. So uh, the truth of it is that we're oftentimes building si single point anchors, um, and we need to make sure that they're strong enough, uh, that our equipment's good, and that our technique is right. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's normal, and that's accepted, and we need to manage it by, uh, by doing all the right stuff and making sure that, uh, that we don't mess it up. One of the last anchors of possibilities I want to talk about here is the position anchor. Uh, in lightweight rope work systems, the position anchor can be a game changer. Uh, it's not one that people are used to using, uh, people who are used to climbing systems and rescue systems otherwise, but in lightweight systems, this is really, uh, this can be amazing because it allows us uh, to put our anchors in places where otherwise there might not be any options. Um, choosing our alignment and getting it correct. Uh, and for our systems that are likely to be in short steps uh, or <clears throat> less than vertical terrain, um, they can provide us plenty of power. So let's look at it. Um, <clears throat> position simply means getting my body braced in a place where I can actually function as the anchor to a system. Um, <clears throat> so I've got my left foot kind of wedged right up against this little rock here, and that's a really good position for that foot right there. Um, I don't have anything with my right foot right now, but that left foot is super strong. So if I have the weight of the system coming in on my left side, um, then this can be really secure. So for instance, if I was giving a, um, a body belay, uh, 
and I had the weighted strand coming in on my left side, this would be a really powerful position. Super strong. If that weighted strand was coming in right from there, um, this would be a really good positive position. Um, if uh, um, I also can use a position anchor with both feet and wedge kind of both feet in there. And if I can get secure with both feet, um, then I can also use my harness. Um, I can use my harness as well. And using my harness, I can either belay directly off my harness, throw a munter on my harness and give someone a belay. They're like, yay. Um, or I can even just fix a rope right here, tie a figure eight on a bite, clip it into my harness, have a rope thrown down there, and then I can actually act as an anchor for, uh, say, a hand line, a fixed line, as a for instance. Um, and this is a pretty strong, powerful position that I'm in right here, um, where take this tree out of the mix. Um, if my alignment is right down this way, um, there's really nothing else right in this neighborhood that would set me up for that alignment. And so having the ability to just plop right down, secure myself in place, and know that I'm in a part of it, that system helping, uh, helping anchor it, anchoring it um, can be really functional. Um, whether I go off my body or off my harness, um, the, you know, I can do either one really. Uh, obviously if I go off my body, I don't have to have a harness on, that's an advantage to that. Also, if I'm body belaying, um, uh, then I can move the rope much more quickly. And similarly, I can get the whole thing set up much more quickly. Um, but if I, I think that I might hold a little bit more force, um, then having it onto my harness is a little bit more comfortable, distributes the, uh, distributes the force better on my body, and, uh, and is a more comfortable way to transition that force onto my body. Uh, but position anchor uh, is a great one for us to be uh, thinking about and using in our lightweight rope work systems. The last way of anchoring I want to talk about is with rock protection. We don't have a whole, we're not likely to carry a whole lot of rock protection with us. So we're just looking for opportunities when it's going to work out well with the alignment that we're looking for. Um, sometimes it really is the, it really can save us. Um, Let's take a look. If I have a crack like this and I have a couple pieces of pro, I might slide my stopper in. Hey, that looks pretty good. I could probably use that. Um, but realistically, in these systems, I'm likely using um, rock protection to build an anchor. Um, so I'm really looking for a place where I can get another piece right nearby and hopefully even figure out a way to equalize these two with minimal equipment. Um, it's not perfectly equalized, but it's close enough. This will work fine. I put a locker here instead of that blue carabiner. Um, I'm going to call this an anchor, and that's going to be fine for my lightweight rope work system in this alignment. <clears throat> Again, if this isn't already a part of your toolbox, you probably shouldn't add it for lightweight systems. Lightweight systems are already limited enough on their built-in security um, that this should be uh, second nature already, or you shouldn't add it. There are many ways to build anchors. Strive for simplicity by using a limited number of anchor configurations that are practiced and versatile will work in a wide variety of situations. Make sure that the alignment and strength are appropriate for the situation that you're using them in. When we talk about fixed lines, the easiest application is a fall line hand line, a hand line that goes directly down the fall line. Um, we can do these on low angle slabs, uh, or we can do them on short, steep steps. So a couple things to think about is when we're actually building one of these things, somebody's got to actually get the rope up there in the first place. Maybe that person uh, is the one in the group who's got sticky rubber shoes. Maybe that's the person who's not exhausted. Maybe that's the most experienced, best climber. Maybe that person took their pack off uh, and went uh, and found some way up there. So somebody's got to get up there uh, or conversely, climb down at the end uh, without, the, without the fixed line. Um, we need to think about alignment. Uh, alignment, it doesn't always line up that the easiest climbing is directly in line with, uh, with, the fixed, with uh, where an anchor is. 
Um, so we're looking for those kind of spots where we can have the easy line of travel that lines up directly uh, with an anchor up above. We can certainly build these with a position anchor, especially on those low angle terrain places, and that provides us more options for where we put our anchors. Um, uh, but it's more common to build these with a natural anchor, either on rocks or trees, or possibly even with some rock protection. Um, especially when we're in short, steep steps, it's pretty common to put knots in the ropes. Um, and those give us a lot more purchase as we're trying to head up, uh, head up a fixed line. Uh, I prefer overhands on a bite, again, just for simplicity, minimizing the number of knots we have. There's others that could be used here, but overhand on a bite is a great simple knot. Um, I like uh, small loops that I can't actually put my hand in, and then I just hold into the, the bulk of the knot there. Um, that seems like that works best. As we're actually traveling up the fixed line, one at a time is super important. We don't want somebody down below yanking on the rope. Uh, and I got to make sure that my hands are free. I don't want to have my hands full with other equipment and stuff as I'm heading up the fixed line. Um, so one of the great things about fixed lines is that uh, once it's set up, it's super efficient to move a group through this kind of terrain. There's no need for harnesses uh, and transitions from one person to the next are super duper efficient. So for large groups moving through short steps or trying to gain security, on, uh, on lower angle terrain, uh, this is a really efficient way to move people through. Let's take a look at this in the short step here. Okay. Oh yeah, I can reach right through to those knots, and that is really, really helpful. One of the other options with fixed lines is to think about using them as a haul line. Haul lines are super effective and really, really simple. For this short step, I climbed up here, but it was a little bit steep. I was gonna set up a fixed line for my partners below me, but I didn't wanna carry my pack up while I was coming up. So I just dropped my pack in the bottom, brought up one end of the rope. I don't even need an anchor up here. Attach my pack onto the bottom of that, the bottom of that rope, and I can just start pu pulling it up. If it gets caught up down there, if I attach my pack midway, my partners can help dislodge it. Um, this can be a super useful way. Of course, looking for clean places where the pack's less likely to get caught up uh, really helps out. Um, so yeah, fixed lines really can be super useful for moving, pe moving people through, allowing us to move without heavy packs on our backs. Okay, the rope's fixed on my end. It's fixed on your end too. Okay. So another option with fixed ropes is using them as a traversing line. We have to make sure that we fix the rope on both ends and keeping it tighter than you think really seems important. Um, you have the option of clipping into a fixed line, a traversing, a traversing fixed line that's clipped on both ends. You can clip directly in your harness or with a little cow's tail of some variety made out of a prusik or whatever. Um, <clears throat> traversing lines can work really well. Um, this is a very exposed terrain uh, and this can keep me really safe in this terrain. Anchor looks good. Rope. Yep, I think that gets me down there. Okay, I'm going to do a quick arm wrap. Head down here. All right. Great. Nice. Okay. So, using this in Using my low angle fixed line provides me security in easy terrain that's highly consequential. I can use arm wraps, which work quite a bit better when you've got jackets on in cold weather. Um, if I'm so inclined and I have a harness on, I could put a prusik on the rope 
Um, or I could just hand over hand my way right on down it. Obviously, a prusik won't work if I have knots in the rope also. Uh, low angle hand lines can provide security uh, when the consequences are high, but it's fairly simple. They're great also for position anchors. All these other options with fixed lines all have their own considerations and pros and cons that are worth considering. Fixed lines are a great option for moving groups of people uh, through short steps of terrain and minimizing the likelihood of consequences becoming a reality. Let's talk about rappelling. Rappelling is a way to use friction to move down fixed ropes. Uh, we can use it to connect two tiers of terrain as our group moves down terrain. We can use it to access somebody who's fallen down steep terrain uh, into an otherwise inaccessible place. Uh, lots of great uses for rappelling. Let's take a look. I need to build an anchor and deploy the rope. I've got this nice rock mass that I've found to sling, uh, to sling around. Um, and I need to, usually with these lightweight systems, I need to think about rope length is definitely one of my concerns. Um, so I have to deploy the rope. I can certainly wrap on a single strand of rope, just fix one end of rope here and throw the other end down. Uh, but then my system's not retrievable. More commonly, I'm gonna feed one end through. I'll take both ends. You can see I've put knots in the end of the rope to make sure I don't wrap off the end. And then I'm with both ends, I'm pulling the rope through so that I end up with the middle of the rope at the anchor. <clears throat> when I get the middle of the rope at the anchor, then I'll take this rope and rope. I'll throw it down there. I'll shake it down a little bit and make sure. There we go, looking pretty good. And I'll make sure that that's on the ground before I actually commit to this line. Oftentimes people will repel with an ATC. Um, <clears throat> And so that clipped into the harness, bites of both ropes into either side of my ATC and clip, then I should be ready to go like that. Um, but in lightweight systems, we really, we rarely have an ATC. So I'll go ahead and just take that out of the mix. If I take that out of the mix, then um, instead of using an ATC, I can use a munter. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and tie my munter with both strands of rope. So I've got my munter there with both strands of rope through. And ideally, I'm gonna get this rigged so that the brake strand doesn't come across the, uh, the gate of the beaner there. So if my, I'm gonna hold on with my right hand as my brake strand, that rope's gonna come across this way and not rub across the gate. Um, this brake strand is the important part for me to hold on to. This is what controls me, makes sure that I don't zip off the end of the rope, uh, or uh, allows me to control my speed as I go down. So I'm going to start to approach the edge. I'm going to control my brake strand as I head out there. Um, and then we'll look at body position as we get out there a little ways. Okay, here I go. Great, so uh, I've gotten out to the edge here and I've got myself in, uh, got my brake strand. I'm gonna hold onto those and I'm committed to those edges, uh, committed to those strands. Uh, I've inspected the edge and made sure I don't have any really sharp point, sharp rocks here or loose rocks that are gonna come down as I start rappelling down. As I start to uh, move down towards the edge here, I'm also making sure 100%, yes, that my rope is long enough. It's gonna be down there. Uh, and as I start heading out here, my body position is that my upper body is gonna stay upright. My feet are gonna be slightly wider than shoulder width apart. And my lower body, my legs, are gonna stay perpendicular to the rock. So as the rock gets steeper, the rock gets steeper, you can see my legs are more straight out in front of me where my upper body stays upright. Hold on in front of me with my guide hand if I want to, but that's really not important. In fact, oftentimes I'll just take two hands onto that brake side and hold on there and control that. And this will allow me to zip right on down to the bottom of this and get myself through something that would have been very difficult to down climb. There's a bunch of ways to belay a rappel. 
Um, in lightweight systems, the most common way is to use a pole belay or a fireman's belay, a bottom belay. And what that means is that somebody down at the bottom of the rappel is going to hold on to those ropes. And once Matt starts rappelling down here, I'm going to keep eyes on him. If he loses control or gets hit by a rock or anything, I'm just going to pull tight. And that'll act like his, his brake strand, his, his brake hand. Uh, and it'll stop him from moving down. So for me, I need to really think about uh, whether he's going to knock rocks on me and try to get myself in the best position I can. I need to be in a place where I can see him. Um, and I need to be ready as he's coming down. Okay, Matt, you're on belay. Uh, hang on, do that again. Uh, Matt, yell it, and then you respond. Okay, as Matt comes on down. He's controlling himself here, but if I give a tug on this, it stops him from moving. All right, Matt, back to you. So rappelling is a great way to have a secure descent down some steep exposed terrain. There are a number of things we need to be cautious about, especially with lightweight systems where we use skinny ropes. Uh, we get a lot less friction than we're used to uh, when we rappel with fatter ropes. And those skinny ropes are a lot harder to hold onto. This eight mil rope, not so bad, but if we're thinking about six mil ropes, it's a lot less friction than we're used to. Some other things to watch out for uh, is that, especially at the top of a rappel, when we're moving from a flat uh, working zone at the top onto, onto steep terrain, those angle changes can be tricky for people to figure out how to get their weight onto the system. Um, watch out for that. Uh, the alignment of the ropes really needs to be right. That rope should be perpendicular to that edge transition uh, to make sure that we minimize the chances for swinging back and forth. Um, <clears throat> swinging back and forth is more likely to dislodge rocks uh, as well as could cause possibility for swinging into corners and such like that. Um, <clears throat> rappelling with a munter hitch can cause a lot of twists in the rope. Uh, that's fine for sh uh, a few short rappels, uh, but if we're doing anything more than a few short rappels, it really is better to have a dedicated descent control device. We have to watch out for things getting caught in our descent control device, whether that's a, whether that's a, a munter or any other device. Um, danglers of whatever variety, long hair, jewelry, uh, zipper poles, hood cord ties, any of that kind of stuff, anything that can get caught up in that device uh, can really cause problems when people are rappelling. With, with these lightweight systems in particular, uh, rope length can really catch you. In a spot like this where we're a long ways back from the edge here, our rope was barely long enough. Um, and this is pretty common because we don't have a whole lot of options for building anchors. Uh, so trying to find something, making sure that our rope length is, uh, is long enough is really important. Along those lines, um, you saw I put some knots in the end of this. With the munter, those knots wouldn't necessarily stop uh, from going through the munter, but they probably would catch in my hand, in my brake hand, as I got to the end there. If I accidentally got to the end there, I would notice those knots and I would hold on to those things. Um, some way to think about trying to um, stop from repelling off the ends of the ropes or one end of the rope uh, is super important. Especially for lightweight systems, we really think about trying to repel from one good working area to another. Uh, we don't want to be in really precarious spots on one end to the other if we can avoid it. Um, working, going from a nice flat spot to a nice flat spot and just repelling down a short, steep part, uh, that's definitely the way to go. We talked about the bottom belay down at the bottom and how important that is to be in a good position, making sure we're not exposed to rockfall and able to, uh, able to belay my repeller as they come down. Uh, and I should mention that accidents really do happen with rappelling. Lots of experienced people have had uh, fatal uh, rappelling accidents. Um, so despite the fact that rappelling is a great solution and can really be the only solution for descending down steep exposed terrain, it warrants a lot of caution due to the sheer uh, free, uh, number of accidents that have happened. Make sure everything's lined up appropriately. In this portion, we're going to look at uh, lowering. 
lowering very similar to rappelling, uh, except that rather than the person who's moving down the cliff, uh, controlling their own speed, the speed is controlled by a separate person at the top of the cliff. It's great for moving less experienced people down through steep exposed terrain. Uh, it's great if somebody's injured. Um, or to provide a little bit of a backup uh, to get the first person down who then can give a bottom belay to the future people who are, will be rappelling. So we'll start with the, uh, with the rope at the top. So again, we've built our anchor up at the top. Um, and we'll start by looking at, a, we'll look at a few different methods for, uh, for lowering. We'll start from the most secure and then move on to the least secure. We'll start with, belay, or with lowering excuse me, directly off the anchor. I'm going to have my patient come in here, my uh, partner, who I'm going to lower down off of this system, and I'm going to get them tied into the end of the rope. I've got my rope stacked here, I've got my anchor built, and I've got the, the other end of the rope uh, attached to the anchor there. Not critical, but uh, certainly minimizes the chances that I have that I zip somebody off the end of the rope. So I'll get my patient in here and tie in. So Matt's going to go ahead and tie himself in here into the end of the rope. While he's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and get my lowering system rigged up here. Uh, so I've got my anchor. I've got uh, a munter that goes into my lock and carabiner there. This will be directly into him. And I can control his speed right like this. Um, I can certainly add a little bit of more security to this. And if I have a harness on and I have a Prusik, uh, I see no reason not to do this. This seems like a better setup. So I'll just take a Prusik and tie a prusik directly onto the brake strand. One, two, and three wraps as we do. And clip that prusik into my harness. <clears throat> For very little cost, I've gotten myself quite a bit more security there. And since I'm looking at my most secure system here, I might as well go with that. Uh, so I'm not actually attached to the anchor here. I have the ability to move around and be in different positions. Uh, and come over and coach Matt as he's going over through the edge there as well. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to go too close to the edge because I'm not actually attached. I just have a Prusik here, um, but we can head on over there. What do you say? Let's take a look at you. So Matt's got a good figure eight. It's into the strong points in his harness, the tie-in points. His harness is good. He's got a helmet. Looks good. Comes back up here. We've got a good munter locked. Our anchor squared. Comes back down here. I've got a three-wrap Prusik. Dress knot locked into my harness, looking double back. Happy with that? Yep. Okay. So as Matt starts heading back over there, um, I am now responsible. Matt, you are on belay and I'm lowering you. Okay. So I'm now responsible for his positioning and speed as he heads down there. And we, important for us to have good communication here. So Matt, I've got you. How's your speed? Speed's good. Okay. He says speed's good. I'm going to keep lowering him down here. I'm tending this Prusik as I go so that I allow him to keep moving. Okay, nice and slow. Nice and slow, he says. So same as rappelling, uh, it can be a little bit precarious for folks making it from the, <clears throat> from the top to the bottom is the edge transition there, um, especially with somebody else controlling their speed. Uh, Matt was really smooth with that. He's giving me a thumbs up. I think that means he wants to go down a little bit quicker. I'm keeping an eye, making sure that the rope's not dislodging any rocks or anything. And I'm going to lower him right on down Five there. Feet. Five feet. I've got plenty of rope. On the ground, on the He's on the ground and off the lay. Matt, you're off the lay. If we don't need quite as much security, the terrain's a little bit lower angle, a little smaller. Maybe my patient is a little bit smaller. Um, then maybe I can get away without using an actual, an actual anchor. I'm going to use position instead. In this case, I'm going to use position with a munter directly off my harness. I've got my munter on my harness. Make sure to get rid of that slack before Matt goes toward the edge there. And as he starts heading towards the edge, I'm lowering him down, controlling his speed. We're maintaining good comms as we go. Okay, Matt, I've got a good position here. I'm ready to go. I've got a munter. I've got my brake hand. You're on belay and I'm ready to lower you. Okay, go ahead and approach the edge. Munter's gonna roll. Okay, all right. Okay, you can go ahead and start to slowly lean back. 
having the rope nicely positioned here so that it's not going to get caught up and snagged as he starts going over the edge there. Super important. And my position, having good stance here, really, really important. You can see Matt's leaning back on this, and I'm just slowly lowering him down. See, he's in the same position he would be if he was repelling, the exact same position. And I'm just holding his weight directly off my harness. Very secure, no problem at all. I can also lower with a position and a body belay. I get a little bit less security, but it's a lot more efficient. I've still got Matt tied into the end of the rope here. Take the rope around behind me, bring it in nice and snug. Make sure I'm really eliminating any slack out of this system. Make sure my rope is situated and ready to go. Matt, I've got you. You're on belay and I'm ready to lower. Okay. Right Matt's heading over toward the edge. I get more friction as I wrap the rope more around my body and less as I open up. Okay, I'm there. As he's at the edge there, I'm going to always start with more friction than I think I need. A really good position with the, okay, cool, cool. the rope that's going to him is on my left side, so my left foot is the one that's really, really secure here. And with my left foot really, really secure, it's super strong position. It's really more just a question of holding this rope and how much it's digging into the back of me. So we'll look at lowering using a terrain belay. Uh, and in this case, actually transitioning and doing this as a part of short pitching, uh, integrated into short roping. So I've been short roping that around. Um, and then we've come to this step here that we need to figure out a way to get down this step. Uh, I found the spot where it makes the most sense for Matt to head down this uh, head down this little cliff, nice and clean, flat. Uh, there's a good transition that he can kind of down climb the first couple steps. Um, so I placed him. He's sitting right near the edge there, and he knows exactly where he's going to go. And I found a spot where the rope is going to just wrap around the horn, and I'm going to get the same kind of friction I would from a body belay, except the rope wrapping around terrain, around rock, rather than around my body. Uh, so I'll move back over that way, wrap the rope around that terrain. Uh, and give Matt uh, and lower Matt down as he starts to head down this terrain. All right, Matt, you're clear on what you need to do. Yep. Yeah. All right. Perfect. And this is my spot that I'm going to be situated as I'm lowering Matt down that cliff there. Uh, so I know I need a little bit of extra rope, so I'll just quickly pull some coils off here. Just pull all of them off, simple, great. I'm gonna hold my rope, got great friction around this horn here. Matt, you can hear me there? Yep. Great. Okay, Matt, I've got you on and ready to lower. Okay. So you can go ahead and transition into that spot that we were talking about. Okay. And I'll hold you here, great friction on this terrain door. Okay, okay. I'm gonna lower. So Matt's getting in position there. Okay, I'm there. All right, I've got you, Matt. You can lean back on that. Okay, lean him back. Okay. How's that speed? That's great. The speed's good? Yep. Okay. Great. If I want more friction, I just wrap this around the rock a little bit more. Super easy to hold here. A little bit less friction. He wants to go faster. We we'll start coming out this way. And it's a little bit harder to hold, but he's able to go a little bit. Just a couple more bits of rock in it make all the difference. Terrain belay a little. How are you doing, Matt? Good. Down. On the ground and off a little. Okay, he's down and off. That means I'm just going to collect this rope. And go around and go scamper down over where he just went. Lowering is a great way to move less experienced people down steep terrain. Uh, maybe they're injured, maybe they're unreliable for whatever reason. It removes the responsibility of them having to manage their brake hand as they're heading down that steep terrain. Things to be careful of, lowering can be unnerving. People don't like to get lowered down generally, and so slower than you think. Lower people nice and slowly. Having good communication is super important. 
Uh, in these lightweight systems, we're oftentimes doing moving through really short bits of terrain, which facilitates communication. But if there's background noise or it happens to be a longer lower, be really, really careful with communication. Avoiding miscommunications is critical. Rockfall, as with all these things, rockfall is really important to think about. Um, as we start to have moving ropes, they're more likely to dislodge rocks, so we really need to think about rockfall. Friction is also an issue for us. With lightweight systems, um, when we're lowering, we're only dealing with one rope as opposed to two. So here, when I'm lowering somebody off the anchor here with, uh, with this 8 mil rope, this munter only has a single strand in it. As compared to when I was rappelling on this 8 mil rope, I had two strands in my munter. So quite a bit more friction when I was rappelling. Um, that's fine, but we just need to make sure that we have enough friction however we're doing it. Um, having on one strand does allow us to go a longer distance, that's nice, uh, but we need to manage friction both in our devices and also making sure that we're able to maintain the brake strand, that brake hand. And then lastly, of course, whoever's doing the lowering needs to figure out some way to descend down as well. If I lower Matt down, uh, down this step down here, uh, maybe I can find a down climb, maybe it's, maybe it's reasonable for me to down climb around, or maybe I transition this into a rappel, and then I rappel down afterwards. The upshot is that lowering is a really useful way to move people who are unreliable or injured, uh, and takes the responsibility away from them having to maintain their break end. When we talk about using belay systems for uh, lightweight uh, rope systems, we're talking about a top belay. Lead belaying simply doesn't make sense. We don't have the equipment. We're not set up to lead belay when we're using lightweight systems. Uh, so we're thinking about top belaying. Uh, generally, we're using the same, uh, a lot of the same setups as we are for lowering. We need to use the same friction. Uh, we have to get somebody to the top. Um, the primary difference uh, is that the, the climber is going to be starting at the bottom rather than at the top. So that makes communication a little bit more challenging. Um, and then the belayer, of course, has to be pulling rope up through the system, which does impact some of the details there. The belayer's got to get to the top. Um, similar to many of these other systems, the belayer has to get to the top, and they have to do that in some kind of way uh, without the security of the rope. Maybe they take their pack off, maybe they have sticky rubber shoes, uh, maybe they're uninjured, um, maybe they're just the most experienced person with the best movement skills. Somehow or another, the belayer's got to get to the top to get this set up. And then we're going to look at the four different uh, friction methods that we did for lowering. Um, and we're going to use those, uh, the same friction methods. Um, we'll look at them this time uh, in reverse order from uh, the least secure to the most secure. We'll start with terrain belay, move into body belay, uh, a munter off the harness, uh, and then a munter off the anchor. The first method of belaying that we're going to look at is belaying using a terrain belay. I was able to scamper right up here, mats down at the bottom, I simply wrap this rope around a horn right here, uh, and then as he climbs up, um, I'm just going to use the friction of this horn to make sure that uh, I'm providing him security. Uh, Matt, I've got you on belay. Come on up. Is that rope nice and tight on you? A little tighter. A little tighter. Yeah, got it. Right there. Great. <clears throat> Excellent. And then Matt, why don't you just for uh, for us to check this out? Why don't you go ahead and lean back on that? And you can see. Just holding this rope right around this friction of this rock here. Super easy for me to hold this. He's leaning right back on it. You good? Okay, come on up, Matt. And we'll just flick this off. And you can come right on in. We're going to continue to look at our belaying techniques, and we'll do this in the context of short pitching. Matt and I have been short roping through this terrain, uh, and we find some terrain that I don't feel confident and secure in moving continuously along with him. Uh, so with the same configuration that we've had, um, we'll stop, I'll stop him, I'll move up through this terrain, uh, and I'll belay him up through a short pitch, uh, and then reconfigure for more short pitches as we go. Um, so we just finished our uh, terrain belay right down below us here, uh, and then we'll move into looking at more security as we move forward here. Uh, so next is going to be a body belay. So Matt, why don't you just take, uh, stay put there. Uh, I'll just go ahead and drop this rope. And you don't need to mess with that at all. 
and I'll cruise up to my next stance. And when I'm up there and you're on belay, I'll tell you to come on up. Okay, so with the body belay, I'm gonna just get myself in a really good position here. I pull up all the rope, but it's snug on mat. The rope that goes to mat is on my right side, so my right leg is my most powerful position. That's where I have the most security. Um, and this is a nice fall line terrain here in this little groove. It's pretty easy. One of the great things, come on up, Matt, you're on belay. One of the great things about a body belay is that I can move rope really quickly. So as he's moving up, um, I can move this rope really quickly uh, and I don't have to worry about him out climbing my belay. So he can move right on up in here. Keep coming right on up, Matt. And as he gets in close, then I'm less concerned about uh, losing track of him. So I can switch to a hand belay and tell him, go ahead, put your butt right on that rock there, Matt. Okay, how are you feeling? Pretty secure right there? That's great. Okay, great. I want to make sure that he's nice and secure and positioned here as I head up on the next little pitch. Um, if I have the option of wrapping the rope around a horn or something, uh, that provides a little bit of extra security. I don't see a great horn right here, but he's got a really good position. Great, so we did a body belay there. I'm gonna move up through this next pitch. Okay, I'll just leave the rope to trail behind me. As I cruise up, a little bit more exposed terrain here. Uh, and it also feels like as I'm coming across this face, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more um, traversy. So if he does happen to weight this system, I'm a little bit more concerned that he might uh, dynamically load the system a bit more than, uh, than he would have in that, on that last pitch. So I probably want a little bit more security, a little bit more ability to hold that rope. So to get a, just a little bit more security, I'm going to go ahead and switch into putting a munter onto my harness there. I've still got a really good position belay here. Uh, because the rope's not coming in on one side or the other, I can brace myself with both of my legs. I've got a great position here and can hold this really well. I've got a munter, or excuse me, a munter into a locker into my harness. And Matt, you're on belay. Come on up. As with any belay, making sure that I maintain my brake hand, make sure that Matt doesn't outclimb me. And then as he's coming towards me here, Matt, you can just start heading towards your right over there towards where the rope is stacked in that easiest terrain. Exactly. And then just right on through over into that nice big flat area right over there. Great, and we've moved ourselves over into this nice big flat area um, across this steep terrain here. So Matt and I have just made it up these first two short pitches using a body belay uh, and a munter off my harness. There's another bit of terrain up here we're gonna head up. Uh, it looks a little bit longer. Um, so I'm gonna do another short pitch here. Uh, but I think this time I'm gonna, in addition to dropping this rope, as I've been doing for the other short pitches, I'm gonna lengthen out my rope so that I make sure that I have enough. I'll just pull off my coils, <clears throat> drop them here nice and stacked cleanly so they'll feed out smoothly as I go. I'm leaving Matt in a nice position here, not at all worried about him falling. Uh, I'm not worried about him grabbing on my rope or anything. Matt, I'm going to go up to the top. Uh, I'll figure out where I can belay you from. Um, when the rope comes snug on you, you'll be on belay. Okay. Um, but I should also yell to you and you'll hear me say on belay. Got it. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll scamper up here. So as I'm looking up here, it looks to me like this terrain is a little bit longer. It also does traverse even a little bit more than that last pitch. So I'm probably going to want a little bit more security than I had in the previous pitch. I get up top here and look around for a horn or something. Oh, there's a horn over there. Get a quick look at it. See how we're looking. Oh, this is going to be great. So I'm going to be able to quickly take a sling, throw it on there, and I'll have a bomber anchor right there. My directions to Matt have been don't climb up unless until the rope's tight on him. So I want to make sure he's on belay before the rope comes tight on him. I'll just go ahead and pull, put him on belay. 
I know I don't have a whole lot of extra there. That feels like him. Matt, is that you? Okay, you're on belay. Climb on up. <clears throat> so then he's going to cruise on up here. He looks pretty secure coming up there. But it's hard for me to manage slack uh, in a pitch that's this long. So while this is a short pitch, it's maybe 75 feet or something, if he were to slip, I would expect a little bit more dynamic loading on this anchor. So I'm pretty happy about having this be transitioned into the train as opposed to on my body. On a munter, it gives me a lot of friction and a secure anchor. Hey, you can just cruise right on through here, Matt. Excellent. And there's our four different options. You're off belay, Matt, I'm taking you off. Uh, and there's our four different options for uh, belay techniques uh, and putting them into the short pitch scenario. Belaying is a great way to provide security to people who can travel under their own power. It's relatively simple uh, and it provides seamless transitions to lowering if somebody is unable to make it through uh, the terrain that they're trying to climb up. There's a number of things to keep in mind with belaying. Communication is key. Making sure that people know when they're on belay and when they're not. Um, short pitches make communication much, much easier. Um, standardized commands make communication much more reliable. But making sure that miscommunications are avoided is essential. Don't outclimb the belay. That's usually the responsibility of the climber to make sure that they don't climb so too fast faster than the belayer can pull the rope through the system. But it's also the responsibility of the belayer to pull the rope through and tell the climber to slow down if they're not keeping up. We have some of the same friction concerns with belaying that we do when we're, when we're lowering. In lightweight systems, when we use skinny single ropes, uh, the amount of friction that we get is less than we're used to in normal climbing systems or rescue systems. Uh, so we have to be aware of the amount of friction that our system is providing us and make sure it's adequate for uh, for the application. We have moving ropes and rock fall is always a concern. We have to watch out for rock fall, especially when the travel line and the fall line don't line up perfectly. If the person is moving side to side across the fall line because that's where the easiest line of travel is, um, then we have to be very wary of rock fall in those cases and making sure we don't have sharp edges or pendulums that can shock load anchors. However, the belaying is a great way to provide security to people who can climb. In lightweight rope systems, it can really make the difference between rapid self-evacuation and waiting for help. When we talk about raising in lightweight systems, really we're thinking about giving, assisting somebody as they're moving up. We're not really thinking about a true haul where we haul somebody up a long slope. But giving somebody a boost up a short step can be super helpful especially if we think about transitioning this seamlessly from a top belay. We can do this as a terrain belay, a one-to-one -one assist, or when we're using a munter, uh, munter belay off an anchor, uh, then we can switch into a three-to-one raising system. With all of those, we need to think about the hall prusik, where it latches onto the rope system, the ratchet, how we're gonna maintain security and keep uh, progress capture involved in the system, and how friction is going to play to our advantage or disadvantage in these systems. Rope diameters can really make a difference. Uh, the, if we're thinking about a real raising system, uh, eight millimeter is really our minimum, minimum diameter of rope. Uh, for a bit of a boost, we could do it with a six mil. Um, but really, eight millimeters minimum diameter for an actual raise. So when I'm giving Matt a top belay, uh, he's got a steep step he's got to make his way up. He's tried to make his way through it, and it's pretty challenging. It's a real short step, but he wasn't able to make his way through. If I need to add a little bit of extra security onto the system or a, uh, a little extra uh, force to give him a boost, he's moved himself back down onto a solid platform down there, so he's standing there. Um, but since he's out of sight and I can't see him, I'm going to keep my hand on that brake line. I'll take a prusik that I happen to have close by, put a prusik around this strand. This is my haul prusik. In my haul prusik, I need to have enough, uh, enough bite on there for that haul prusik to, uh, to catch so that I'm able to pull him up. I'll shorten this up just by tying a quick knot in it to get a shelf in here. That just provides me a little bit more room in my system. 
And by sliding this down here and going right like that, I've essentially made myself, I've essentially made myself a three to one system. Now, of course, I've got so much friction in this system that it's more like a two to one, but it's enough to give them a bit of a boost. Hey, Matt, are you ready to try again? Okay, yes. get yourself up into a spot where you're uh, ready to climb. Okay, I've got a little extra boost for you. I'm ready. Okay, and even if he gets part way, I can slot, hold on to the brake, push this forward. Are you through it? One more. One more. Okay, here we go. Here he goes. He's through it. Excellent. And then I can just forget about that and go right back to belaying him. Hey, Matt. Will you try to climb up and see if you can make it? Climb! Okay, I'm giving Matt a terrain belay here as he's trying to make it up this step. What's that? You can't get that move? Okay. Hey, uh, how about if we give you a little boost up it? Okay, hey Steve, since you're standing right there, I'm gonna maintain this break end on this, on this terrain belay and keep it in this orientation. Can you just try to give Matt a little boost, kind of a one-to-one, -one just like pulling in line on that rope? All right, on yours. Okay, let's do it. On three, one, two, three. Hey Matt, here it comes. One, two, three. There we go. Here it comes, Matt. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh yeah. Oh, that's it, that's it, I'm there. All right, all right. And then you can let go, Steve, and I'll just keep terrain belaying him. One of the big things for us to be cautious of when we're doing raising systems or providing an additional boost to somebody is to make sure that we're being helpful. That sounds obvious. But when we start pulling somebody uphill, we want to make sure that we're not pulling them into the rock into roots. Maybe their leg is caught on something and we're jamming them in, crushing their pelvis. We need to make sure that the alignment that we're hauling the person is actually helping them and not just making things worse. With lightweight systems, we're not really thinking about true raising up a long ways, but thinking of this as a positive belay up short distances can be a really useful tool that we can apply and make all the difference between uh, getting stopped and moving on through simply. A lightweight rope work kit can really expand your capabilities in the wilderness. It can be the difference between completing an objective and turning around. It can be the difference between a quick self-evacuation of an injured companion and waiting for help. Bringing the right gear is an important piece of the puzzle, but it's only a small piece of the puzzle. Sometimes we refer to these systems as improvised systems, but make no mistake, these systems should be practiced and should follow regular rope work principles. Technical details are fundamental. The hard part really is the application. Choosing the right system, making sure to make the minor adjustments that make that system work in that particular situation, and having clarity in communication. Try to anticipate problems as much as you can. Common problems include rope length issues, managing skinny ropes for grip and friction in munter hitches, uh, considering loose rock and how that'll play out, especially if you don't have a helmet. Alignment, making sure alignment lines up with the fall line or the line of travel, um, and anticipating small changes in, in the terrain, and of course, communications. Some other things to be aware of, is edge awareness. When we have limited equipment and short ropes, people end up working near the edge. Make sure to keep that edge awareness and situational awareness high. And of course, these situations, make sure that when you're using these rope works, these rope systems, you're making the situation better rather than worse. It can be easy to get in over your head, especially when there aren't many fail safes. Make sure you're making it better. There's no substitute for practice. Get your hands on gear, practice, practice, practice. And when you're out there, 
don't be shy to look for simpler options. Just because we have the tools at hand doesn't mean we should use them. If there's a simple, non-technical option, walking around, micro-navigation, passing packs, um, being prepared and bringing sticky rubber shoes, uh, if we can find simple, uh, non-technical options, that's the right way to go. Thanks for joining us for the lightweight rope work and rescue session and coming to the WMS DIM uh, virtual conference session. I'm Andy Rich. I've had Matt Haberman and Steve Akalis with me from Remote Rescue Training. We'll see you next time.